Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. There were four quarterbacks taken in the first round of the 2004 NFL Draft. The first one was Eli Manning. Manning would go on to have an incredible NFL career, winning two Super Bowls as a member of the New York Giants and finishing into the top 10 in NFL history for both passing touchdowns and passing yards. He's very likely going to be a Hall of Famer. The second one taking was Philip Rivers. Rivers would also go on to have an incredible NFL career, playing 17 seasons in the league while making eight Pro Bowls and finishing into the top five all-time in passing yards and touchdowns. The third one taken was Ben Roethlisberger. The two-time Super Bowl champion is still playing today, is in the top 10 all-time in passing yards and touchdowns, and is also going to be in the Hall of Fame when he retires. The first three quarterbacks taken were all A-plus picks who are going to be remembered as really good players for a really long time. As for the fourth... Hang on, let's back up just a bit before I show the play that defined J.P. Lossman's NFL career and the decision that was panned by just about everyone immediately afterwards. December 14, 2008, we're at Giants Stadium for this AFC East matchup between the New York Jets and the Buffalo Bills. To say that this game is a must-win for the Jets would be an understatement. Buffalo had collapsed by this point in the season. After a 5-1 start, they dropped six of their next seven games to be at 6-7 and, and firmly out of the playoff picture. But the Jets were still alive. After starting 8-3 and, and looking like one of the best teams in football under Brett Favre, they had dropped two straight games, and were now on the outside looking in with the playoff picture. With how close the AFC was, the Jets had no room for error if they wanted to play some January football. They had to beat Buffalo, or their season was all but over. Early on, things are going great for the Jets. Thomas Jones punches it in from two yards out on the opening drive of the game to make it 7-0. And on the very next drive, Brett Favre finds Jericho Cotchery for an 11-yard touchdown. Two drives, two touchdowns, and a 14-3 lead. Pretty tough to have a better start to the game than that. Unfortunately for New York, Buffalo's offense was looking awfully good on this day, and the Jets started to cool down offensively. The Jets led 21-17 at the half, and had trouble moving the ball in the second half. The only offensive points the Jets had were a field goal that came on an 8-yard drive where they started inside the Buffalo red zone. And with just about five and a half minutes left in the fourth quarter, Fred Jackson ran it in from 11 yards to give the Bills the lead. Buffalo led it 27-24, and after a force of three and out, the Bills got the ball back with a chance to run out the clock and potentially end the game. The Bills get a first down by giving it to Marshawn Lynch three times in a row. Now there's just over two minutes left. First down with 2.11 left, and Lynch gets five yards. The Jets burn their first time out. That brings up second down with 2.06 left. What happens next can only be described as an early Christmas gift to Jets fans everywhere. Roll the tape. That's right, instead of running the ball, they decide to throw with J.P. Lossman, who completely makes a mess out of things. Sean Ellis recovers the fumble, scores a touchdown, gives the Jets a 31-27 lead out of thin air, and the Jets would wind up winning it by that scoreline. What almost looked like a surefire victory for Buffalo was now a shocking loss. And when I say that everyone panned this decision afterwards, I truly mean everyone. In the post-game highlights show on NFL Network, Rich Eisen was laughing at the move. Jets linebacker Brian Thomas said that he was shocked at the play call. The New York Post called it boneheaded and said that even though it wasn't the miracle at the Meadowlands, it was the stupidity at the swamp. Many publications question or not Jerron would get fired in the wake of that call. And even Bills head coach Dick Jerron regretted the play, saying it was a call that he wished he had back. Again, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who was willing to defend Jerron for the decision. But nearly a decade and a half later, I'm willing to give it a shot. Because as bad as this decision looked, this call might not be as bad as you think. Dick Jerron deserves a chance to be defended for this play, and I'm going to do so here. Welcome to In Defense Of. Let's dive right in. Before I break down the decision, we have to first ask ourselves what the purpose of the play was. Why would you not run the ball here? Well, with the clock at 2.06, the two-minute warning coming up, and the Jets having two timeouts, it poses a really interesting scenario. If you call a running play here, the odds that the Jets are able to burn a timeout before the two-minute warning are fairly high. If you call a passing play here, however, you're pretty much guaranteed that no matter what, the clock will hit the two-minute warning. 
In the grand scheme of things, a play like this could amount to a 40 second difference, which is absolutely critical. So before examining the play itself, I guess we have to ask ourselves whether or not a run could have taken 6 seconds off the clock. I looked at every run from scrimmage that the Bills had in this game, looked at how many seconds came off the clock on each play, and then averaged those out together. I'm not counting a fake punt run that they had in the first quarter, or plays where Lossman ran it himself. When they handed the ball off to a running back, on average, how much time came off the clock? Of the 29 carries that the Bills had on this day, they averaged out to 5.46 seconds, meaning that by playing the odds, the Jets would have been able to call a timeout before the two-minute warning. But even though that number is below the six-second mark, it's actually still inflated. If we just look at the second half runs, the average run took almost exactly five seconds off the clock. Of the 29 runs that the Bills had, just seven of them took at least six seconds off the clock, meaning that the odds of the Jets being able to call a timeout before the two-minute warning were over 72%. And in the second half, only three runs, including none on that drive, took at least six seconds off the clock, with the odds of the Jets being able to burn a timeout being roughly 79%. Based on how the half was going, there was a 4-5 and five shot that if you ran the ball here, it was not going to work as intended. Now there's a pretty solid counter-argument that you might be thinking to yourself. Number one, Marshawn Lynch was having a pretty good game. He was averaging over six yards per carry. You give the ball to him twice to make up five yards, and he's probably going to get it, and you win the game that way. And number two, not running the ball means you're putting the game in the hands of J.P. Lossman. This isn't like other episodes of In Defense Sub where the coach had every right to trust his quarterback to do the right thing, like MVP Brian Seip, or MVP Joe Theismann, or Dan Marino. This is J.P. Lossman we're talking about here. Well, let's address both of those points. Starting off with Marshawn Lynch. Yes, he was having a good game, but a lot of that was front-loaded with the first half, where he had a few runs that went greater than 10 yards, including an incredible 35-yard run on the opening drive of the game that was the true definition of beast mode. In the second half, he was cooling off. On his last seven carries, he was only averaging 3.8 yards. If you go back to the end of the first half and look at his last 13 carries, once again, he was only averaging 3.8 yards. The odds weren't great that he would have picked up the first down on that second down play. And then when you consider on third down that the Jets would have absolutely stacked the box and put everyone up front, it at least makes some sense why they opted to throw the ball here. While I don't want to say the Bills were struggling to run the ball because that's not true, the idea that they were moving it at will against the Jets' defense and that the Jets wouldn't have been able to stop it even when they knew what was coming, was simply not true. As for the Lossman point, there's two important things to touch on here. Number one, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that Lossman was a good or even an average quarterback, because he was not. He was bad. However, he was actually playing alright during this game. He was 20 for 30 with a passing and a rushing touchdown. He had only turned the ball over once, and that was an interception that was dropped by his receiver. On Buffalo's last drive, he went 4 for 4 for 44 yards with three of those passes going for first downs. By this point in the game, he had somewhat of a hot hand. It's not like Lossman was a turnover machine who couldn't hit water if he was sitting on the dock. He was giving the Jets' defense some fits on the last drive. At the very least, a little bit of confidence and trust in him to do the right thing was warranted. And number two, he knew the situation. That's why the play was designed to get out of the pocket, so if nothing was there, he could just throw it away without intentional grounding being called. That meant that the only way that the play could have backfired in spectacular fashion as it did here, is if someone came to him from the blind side. That raises the question, who was the left tackle here? Well, that's Jason Peters. Peters made the Pro Bowl the year before and was named a second team All-Pro. He was going to make the Pro Bowl in 2008 as well and would be named a second team All-Pro that year. He was widely regarded as one of the best tackles in all of football. And obviously we didn't know it at the time, but he would go on to make nine Pro Bowls, an all-decade team, and is likely going to wind up in cannon someday. For this play to fail, Jason Peters, of all people, would have had to whip on his assignment in absolutely spectacular fashion, to the point where Lossman would have no time to process what was happening. Lossman said after the game that coach put a lot of trust in the players to make the play. It's a funny shaped ball for a reason. It bounces weird ways sometimes. And I think that sums it up. Dick Duran didn't want to run the ball because he wanted it to get down to the two-minute warning and catch the Jets off guard since they were expecting a run, and since the running game was a bit iffy in the second half. He trusted J.P. Lossman who was 4 for 4 on the drive before to do the smart thing, and trusted Jason Peters, one of the best tackles in football, to know his assignment and make the block. I'm not entirely sure I can blame the coach here for the Jets somehow scoring a touchdown on the play. Now let's be perfectly clear, Dick Duron was not a good head coach. You could very easily make the argument that he was one of the worst head coaches in the history of the franchise, but I'm more than willing to give him a pass for this play, even if he himself had second thoughts about the decision. Maybe Jerron should have tried to run the ball and give it to Marshawn Lynch. But when you consider the fact that running the ball would have enabled the Jets to call a timeout, 
the fact that the Jets knew a run was coming and have been able to stop it as of late, the fact that Lossman was playing well, the fact that the play failing was because one of the best tackles in football completely whiffed, and the fact that the most important thing for the Bills here with the lead was managing the clock correctly, this is one decision you can definitely make a defense for. Be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this, get in down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. Also, special links to all of our Patreon supporters for the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.